Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran. Welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, ably led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and the point where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your virtual university is brought to you by the Springboard Roche Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse Just B, the enterprise group Enterprise Your Advantage, UMB Bank, celebrating 50 years in banking with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic communications group. We also are partnering Central University, Ghana's premier Christian private university. Today we continue the journey in the engine room, Mosul's favorite program, exploring the behind the scenes stories of many frontline personnel in the arts, entertainment, media, corporate life, sometimes political, medicine, and every other area of interest, finding out the what, the why, the where, the whom, the tough decisions, the tears that undergird their work. My guest for today has recently celebrated eight years on the hot seat of the Super Morning Show, sitting behind the console since the 7th of August 2014. As host of the Super Morning Show, Koji Yangson's voice is the first that you hear, or even more importantly, that voice that brings perspective to issues of national and global importance. But does he have a life? Does he face battles on every side? What pressures does he have to deal with in the course of his job? And what don't we see when he smiles behind the console? Could you good to see you? <laughs> the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Looking forward to this. <laughs> let, let me ask you, are, are these questions real? Uh, absolutely. And as you were asking them, I realized that Perhaps we'll find out some of the answers together. I, I yes, guess so. I do. I certainly don't know. <laughs> Let's start with congratulating you for eight years on, on the hot seat. H how hot is the seat? Oh, my goodness. It's boiling. The, the pressure of expectation for a brand like Joy has always been the highest. From the very beginning, from the days of uh, Tommy Annan Forsen, Dusty Wayne, Ajoa Edu, Komlad Dumo, uh, Kojo Apong Kruma, all the big names that have occupied that seat have succeeded mainly because the expectation has been through the roof. And I was fully aware of this, you know, when I first had the privilege of taking up this job. And it has not relented. If anything, it's got worse. The more people seek solutions to their daily problems, the more they expect us to be a part of that solution. And the, more they, and the less they expect us to get things wrong. So unlike a, a, a receptionist or a, a secretary or a, an administrator who can quietly do their work in an office, type up their documents, if they make a mistake, they can take out the paper, you know, scrunch it up, throw it in the bin and start again. Our work is done in the full glare of the public eye. And they are watching everything you do. They are listening to every word you say. And they have no margin for error. Just Why? Must, it's understandable because they depend on us to make good choices. They need to be informed in order to make good decisions. And we're talking about the best of us, our audience. We call them the discerning listeners because they are. These are the people at the top of all professions in this country. They are the decision makers of our nation, the movers and the shakers. One decision made by a joy listener probably affects no less than 10 people. In some cases, hundreds and thousands of people. So they can't afford to make these decisions on bad information. And they're coming to us, they're choosing us. It's not like, um, you know, it, it's, it's not like the, every day we are competing. For the typical joy listener, they've made a decision that it's us they will come to. And once they've made that decision, it's now our job to justify that choice every day, to make them feel that they made the right choice. And so the pressure is incalculable. Growing up, did you think that you would 
one day get to the point where six million people or so are making decisions based on the information you churn out there? The truth is yes. From, from the time I was about 17 years old, I knew I wanted this job. Which job? Hosting the Super Morning Show on Joy FM. Not just being a broadcaster? No. Tell me. In fact, I didn't really care much about being a broadcaster. I just wanted to host the Super Morning Show. Why? Well, one day in Tema, I had gone to spend the holidays with my aunt, who, um, who lived in Community 5. I must have been about 16, maybe 17. I doubt I was 17 yet because I was about to go to first year uh, of university. I just finished my A-levels. And my job in the morning was to clean her husband's car. So I think one day I was just cleaning the interior and perhaps my elbow must have accidentally hit the power button on the stereo. And the radio came on. And there was somebody called Uncle Tommy who was cracking jokes and making people laugh. And he, he seemed to know everything. He knew what was happening at the National Theatre. He knew where there was traffic in town. He knew where the president was and what he'd be doing that day. He knew the price of Fan Yogo and what promotions Fan Yogo was doing. He knew everything. And people would call in and he seemed to talk to everyone as if they were his friends. He would get 20 phone calls and he would joke and laugh with every single one of those 20 people. It sounded like this man was sitting in a big chair in the middle of a massive console of information. He knew everything and everyone came to him. There was something so deeply attractive about that. Now, I remember my 16 or 17 year old self thinking, I would love to do that. And so it wasn't long after that when I went to university, I think it must have been in my second year, I was sitting on the stairs at Valco Hall and I saw a group of people going up the stairs with equipment. I was curious, I followed them, they went all the way up to the top floor where there was a, a kitchenette which they seemed to have commandeered and they were setting up equipment for a radio station. So right at the beginning. Right then, this was in, oh goodness, 1999 maybe? So they were setting up equipment. I asked them what it was. They said, oh, new radio station for Valco Hall called Radio Valco. I thought, wow, that's interesting. You can do this. So for the next two, three days, while they were setting things up, I was just hovering and watching them. And they started to record these little sweepers and liners for the station, you know, little jingles that they would play to announce the station. They call them idents, station idents. And I kept coming up with these funny ideas for station idents. And I would say them in like local Cape Coast accents, like the accents of the fishermen, which is always funny, you know. So I was giving them these funny ideas for idents and they thought, wow, this guy sounds great on radio. Would you like to join us? Would you like to be a presenter? And I thought, only if you let me do the morning show. So, so I guess I was the first to audition for the morning show. Nobody else did after me. Wow. And so I got the job. So for three years, uh, from my second year till when I left, I hosted the morning show on Baku uh, Radio. But guess what? During my commercial breaks, I had this little transistor radio that I would put on the top louver blade of the studio and tilt the angle of the antenna to a certain was... degree so I could catch Joy FM in Accra and listen to Komla Dumo, who had then taken over from Tommy and Anforsen. So during my commercial breaks, I'd, I'd listen to Joy and then I'd come back, switch on the microphone, and do the, the morning show in Cape Coast. So, I mean, my fixation with Joy never left. The only reason why I was at Radio Vaco was because I hoped to be the host of the Super Morning Show one day. That's a beautiful story you tell, because for everyone, if I may use the word, the ultimate that you desire will not come on a plate for you uh, right at the inception. So you were saying that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, starting from somewhere with a certain outcome in mind, and progressively working towards that. I like the way you describe it to me and i It's a very beautiful description. You're saying that <laughs> the, the man was almost like everybody's friend and he had a way of connecting with everybody. You know somebody else who does that so well? Tell me. Auntie Joyce Ig. Absolutely. It's a miracle. I mean, she's just a walking miracle. Everyone I meet sees I have a special relationship with her and they are right. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Try, think think about, about that. How she manages it. Think about that. Yeah. I think I'm her. Best friend. Yes, it's I'm a, completely a wrong. Clearly, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill and an anointing. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. 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 So that's what you liked about Tommy. 
I loved that about mm. him. And then the fact that he knew everything. Yeah. From Fanny Go to what? Fanny Go to National Theatre. He just seemed to be have his. He seemed to have his pulse on everything. You know? Right. And uh, I absolutely wanted to be that. So Tommy first, and then while you were at Valco monitoring Kamala, who's probably a larger than life character that absolutely. has come to you, symbolize the yeah. very best of the Swimoni yeah. show yeah. Um, for many people. Yeah. Then you ended up in London. Mm. What happened? Well, I finished university and uh, went off to England. That had always been the plan. I wanted to go and spend some time there, study and work and so forth. But even there, I still wanted to do broadcasting. So I remember applying for several jobs in broadcasting. I went to the BBC, to Channel 4, to ITV. I applied for jobs which later turned out to be internships, unpaid internships. Oh, so you got, you got to do broadcasting? Actually, like no, I didn't. Because as soon as I realized they were internships, I backed out. Really? Well, I had to eat somehow. And these internships, I mean, in, in, in the BBC, they will not pay you to be an intern. You are getting so much out of just being around these people that you're not going to get a salary on top of it as an intern. So they expected you to do that for a period of time before you would even be considered for employment. And I knew I wouldn't survive if I didn't have a source of income. And this would be a full on, you know, full time job. So on two occasions, I got shortlisted and then I just backed out when I was told the terms and conditions that I would have to, you know, uh, work without pay. So for many years, I actually abandoned, or let's say shelved my plans to be a broadcaster. But even in, that, in, in those fallow years, there was something I used to do. And I, this is probably the first time I'm admitting this. I love those admissions. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tune in and listen to Komla and later Kojo Opon Nkrumah uh, hosting the Super Morning Show. And I would be lying in my bed listening to them and imagining how I would do it. So... I would hear Kojo Opon Krumah, for example, uh, you know, delivering some information about, uh, you know, some new tariff that was, you know, going to be uh, implemented by government. I will take in all the information. And then during the commercial break, I would lie in bed and recite it as if I was presenting the show. Hmm. How would I have given out that information? So I always fancied myself in the role, even when I felt like I was so far away from it. So you might say that even though I never knew when I'd get it, I was still preparing for it. But that's, that's very interesting. What, what kept driving you as you, you worked your way, even 6,000 kilometers away, worked your way into your dream job? What, what kept pushing you? It was the only thing I had discovered I loved. I found that I was capable in many things, but it was the only thing I found that I loved. And it, it just made it different for me. At the time, I was training to become a, a, a town planner. I was in um, university. I was studying estate development. Eventually, I became a town planner, or as they call them, an urban architect. But much as I was good at it, my love was elsewhere. You know, and it just never went away. Maybe it's because... I found it difficult to do things that I don't love. Let me come to that. How critical is it to love what you do in any field of endeavor? Broadcasting is one, but mm. for anybody seeking to be at the very top of your field, mm. how critical is it to really love what you do? Well, I can speak for myself. I remember when uh, I was in secondary school, you know, in the old system, you either do o le you, you do your O levels and then you go and do the A levels. Now, before you write your O levels, when you get to form three, which today would be JHS three, you have to choose between arts, business, and science. Now, in fact, for science students, you don't make the choice. If you are in the top uh, thirty percent of the class, you you will be chosen to be a science student. Mm -hmm. Then the rest have to struggle for same the rest. Same in our time. I thought it was a distinct. But Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It was a very big tradition. Yeah, it was the same in Saint Augustine's. So I, I was in the top thirty percent. I was one of the best students in my class. So naturally. I was selected for science. This was, of course, part of the grand cosmic plan. My father wanted me to be a doctor. In fact, he was fanatical about it. He used to introduce me to his friends when I was five years old as a future doctor. 
So it was just an automatic expectation in my house that I would become a doctor. I later learned that it was because he wanted to be a doctor, but he was afraid of blood. Oh, another matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was expected of me, but I hated maths with a passion. I mean, I would pass the exam, but I hated it. I mean, I, I, I would sit in maths class and it was like I was being stabbed. Every time they put up an equation on the board and I had to work my mind around, it was just, it, it wasn't impossible. It was just too painful and I hated it. So I didn't want to do it. If there was any class I wanted to skip, it was maths. So when at Form 3, we were supposed to choose between arts, business and science and my name was put in the science class, I went and changed it to arts because I love literature. Right. So I changed it to arts and I couldn't tell my parents until Form 5. So I went for two years with my parents thinking that I was a science student. They were buying me science textbooks. Really? And then I would go and buy arts textbooks. Did you see your report? You see, that was the funny thing. So when my reports came in, my father was interested in how I did in maths, English, and... and, and um, General uh, science. Uh -huh. So I would give him those, and then he would ask, how about the other subjects? How are you doing with this? How are you doing with that? And I'd say, fine. And he had um, a friend who was a, a teacher in Ogasco called Mr. Obudai, now Professor Obudai, who revealed my subterfuge to him. He came to the school and caned me. I'm, the, I'm perhaps the first and only student whose father has come to the school to cane him. Yes, yes, he was about I'm that. not joking. Was he I'm a at that time? Yes, he was. He passed to Ogasco since he could have walked. Very short distance. <laughs> but, oh, he drove to conserve his energy for the for caning. The caning. But you see, I tell you the story to explain that. I find it diff. In fact, my constitution rebels against anything that is too hard to do. Really? I feel like if it's too difficult to do, it might not be worth my time. I expect a certain level of challenge with the things I do. But it must be a challenge that my spirit welcomes. I must look at it and feel like, you know what? This is possible if I apply myself. Let me juxtapose this against the pressure that comes with working on the Super Morning Show. I want to believe that the pressure is multifaceted. And even from where I sit, I can see the pressure that comes from, from upstairs, from, from management wanting more every single day. Because, it, I mean, there used to be those glass that they look through into the <laughs> studio. <laughs> now, they, the new configuration doesn't have that. But mm. I, I expect that while you're on air, mm. Samuel Dami is getting calls it from within, mm. then also from without, yeah. from government, then from, from governments, so we, we don't even single out anyone, mm. and then from people who have interest that they think your show may infringe on or touch on. When those interests get intense and you get possibly misunderstood, mm. do you still love what you do? You see, if I didn't, I would fail. If I didn't love it, I couldn't possibly do it. This is not a job for the faint-hearted. Mm. In fact, it's not, it's not a job for most strong-hearted people. It is very difficult to walk that fine line of objectivity when you obviously have opinions and your opinions could actually cause more harm than good. And you have to somehow figure out a way of reining it in, communicating in a way that actually furthers the development of our nation rather than hindering it. It's difficult to do our job when there are so many personal and private interests pushing and pulling you and your mind is supposed to remain on the public good. It is difficult and if you don't love it, you can't do it. I can say this without challenge for any of the people who have done this job before me. If Kojo Waponkuma didn't love it, he would have failed. If Komla Dumo didn't love it, he would have failed. Tommy Anand, Fosse, all of them. If they didn't love this job, there's, in fact, you can't do it. So, in some ways, this has always been the perfect job for me. Because it, the number one requirement is love. And I grew that from age 16 for this job in particular. This is Springboard, your virtual university, and I love what I do. And my guest for today in the engine room <laughs> is Kojo Yangson. We've been waiting for a while to do this. Kojo and I have been talking about this for years, but there's always the perfect time. And today we particularly are celebrating eight years in the hot seat 
of the super morning show. Could you say the seat is not hot, it's boiling? But he says that in the face of all those pressures that come with working on that job and the interests that fly from all directions, the love is what keeps him going and focused in the face of all those sometimes conflicting demands. You mentioned something that catches my attention very beautifully, objectivity vis-a-vis -vis interests flying from all directions. But the thing that caught my attention the most is national good. Help me to understand your concept of national good. Hmm. It, it, it's a difficult one. So what's national good? I suppose there is no particular thing that a nation can do that would advantage all people equally. There's no such thing. But one thing that everybody in, a, in any nation can agree on is that things have to get better. All things have to get better. And so, for me, national good is very simple to explain, even though it's difficult to achieve. National good is about making things better. That's it. And our country has very well-defined problems. Our problems are very easy to define. In fact, when you switch on your radio, that's more likely what you will hear, people defining our problems. It's very easy. So if we know what the problem is, then we know what the solution is. The disagreement is how to implement these solutions. That's where we are polarized. Everybody wants things to be better. Doesn't matter which party you belong to, doesn't matter which football team you support or which church you go to, you want things to be better. That's the one thing we can all agree on. So that is national good. That is, that is a, I'll even call it public good because it transcends nations. But it is a good that we can all agree on. The things that, back, that combat against it are personal interest. That is the biggest enemy of public good. Help me understand. Anytime something seems like the obvious solution, but it does not get implemented. It's because somebody benefits privately from the problem. And the reason why in our country we struggle so much to develop is because those who benefit privately from the problem are the same people that we have employed to solve the problem. And we have given them carte blanche. We've given, we have a presidency that has so much power. Our presidency, because of the power rendered to it by our constitution. Our president is far more powerful than a president in a dictatorship like Rwanda. I kid you not, our constitution allows our president to do far more than a dictator in Rwanda can do. Do you think we should change something about the constitution? Oh, absolutely. But unfortunately, the person whose job it is to change it will always be the president. And people will come along and sit in that seat and realize how much unfettered power they have. Tell me, is it not then against their nature to solve the problem when they are the main beneficiaries of it? This is springboard unpacking the thinking, the ideas, the motivation, the inspiration, the drive, the passion, the love of Koji Yangsen, host of the Super Morning Show for the past eight years. He's done other shows like the AM show, like the auto show and one interesting one that is gradually unpacking that will be revealed one of these days. We are trying to find out what inspires him, what drives him. And I'm going to come back from this break. I'm going to find out when he gets misunderstood, when he gets into battles that he didn't plan for in the morning when he woke up, what does he do? And that's when it's going to get extremely interesting. This program is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, Just Be, the Enterprise Group, Enterprise Your Advantage, UMB Bank, celebrating 50 years in banking with the undergirding support of the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Communications Group. On page 18 this Tuesday, the full story of Koji Yangsen is going to be unpacked. Also on MyJoy Online and springboard.com.gh, the full transcript of everything could you have said. Get it, get your friends to read it and love it and like it and share it. We also are partnered by the Central University, Ghana's premier private Christian university. Let's take a break. When we come back, let's get deeper 
into the boiling seat of Koji Yangson. Please don't go away. <laughs>1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Welcome back to Springboard of Virtual Investing and to this amazing conversation with my friend and brother, Koji Youngson host of the Super Morning Show for the past eight years. He describes that as a boiling seat, and we've been finding out where the temperature emanates from and how love is the key driver. This is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation in partnership with our various sponsors, the MTN Pulse, Just Be, Enterprise Group, Enterprise Your Advantage, UMB Bank, celebrating 50 years of supporting Ghana's entrepreneurs to build thriving organizations. And this year, as a celebrate, we are saying, come to UMB and find out how your SMS can be grown into a thriving business organization. We also are recognizing today our partnership with Central University and, of course, the multimedia group and the graphic communications group that make this possible for you to listen to and watch every single week. Kuju has been sharing with us about the weight of responsibility 
Number two, hosting the SMS and wanting to do that since he was 17 when he stumbled upon Tommy and Anforson, who knew the price of yogurt as well as big time national issues and seemed to be nice to everyone who called into the show. The third was about being there at the inception of Valco and helping to do station idents and then going on to host the Super Morning or the morning show on Valco Radio at the University of Cape Coast. The fourth was about time in London applying to broadcasting houses like the ITV, BBC, and finding out when you were shortlisted that it was going to be full-time internship, unpaid internship and backing down. Could you, if, 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 if there was some small alawa, would you have done it? Oh, I think I would have. If I could just, if I could pay my rent. If, if you could do something, because I, I just think that the, the internship at the BBC would have added something additional to what you do at the time. Yes. So how do you balance that with the fact that actually you also had to eat and therefore you had to run away? But you know, God has a plan for everything. Because I may not have come back mm. if I had ended mm. up, mm. you know, at the BBC. But I mean, God had a different plan, clearly. I'll talk about mm. God when, when, I, when yeah. I come back, when I finish the summary. So the mm. fit was about rehearsals, lying in bed and repeating what Komla, Dubo and Kujo Pankruma had said and trying to add your own style to see what would I do differently if I, if I got a chance. The sixth was about, about love. Big one, very big one that you, you are capable of different things, but broadcasting is what you love. And if you didn't love it, you couldn't have done it. That's a big one. The seventh is about parental expectation. And that's the funniest, of course, <laughs> about your father wanted, wanted you to be a doctor because he hadn't... What, what, do, you, what do you lecture in? Uh, marine biology. In fact, uh, he passed away last year. And he... he Sorry about at, that. Yeah, at the time of his death, was one of the world's leading, if not the world's leading, expert on shellfish. Shellfish, yes. marine biology. Marine biology. So he's, I mean, he was at the top of, of his, his profession. Field, but he wanted to be a doctor. He maybe, wanted to be a doctor. With the benefit of hindsight, he, he went where he should have been anyway. Yeah, God has a plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> Keeps coming up and, and it's so clear. Yeah. But he wanted you to do what he couldn't have done, like he most did. parents end up doing. And I swerved him. And you swerved him and he killed you. Yeah. <laughs> Publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so all Augusto O students, what, what year group? 94. All Augusto 94 year group. Um, mates of Kuyangsen listening, listening right now, please, if you have in any way a picture of when Kuju was being killed, it's a priceless national asset. Let us have it. Uh, we will relive the moment when, thank, thank when Prof was killed. No <laughs> you know what? Someone would have streamed their life to the whole world. The, the, the eighth was about objectivity and how difficult it is, it is to be objective when you have your own opinions and also have different interests flying at you. The ninth is about public good. Nice one. He says, you said there's nothing the nation can do that will benefit everyone, but at least what we do must make life better. And you see, we often agree on our problems and sometimes even the solutions, but the how is where we get polarized. Yeah. The tenth one is about personal interest, which you describe as the greatest enemy to public good. And in your opinion, you see, whenever something that is so beneficial doesn't get done, it's because somebody who has some power or the decision-making opportunity has an interest that runs contrary to that good thing. And very often, they're the ones who also have the responsibility to make things good for all of us. Very big point. Hmm. Could you let's talk about being misunderstood? Because that's a big part of what you do. Yeah. Do you sometimes feel that you wish you could explain to people why you do what you do so they don't understand that you are seeking hmm. public good? You know, it's the biggest irony of our job that even though we are the custodians of the microphone, we don't have the opportunity to use it for our personal benefit. We don't have the opportunity to use it to advertise our own intent. We have to be a conduit of other people's thoughts and ideas. And we have to be a moderator of other people's conversations. Yes, we make a valuable contribution to those conversations, but it can never be about us. And so we are the first people to be misunderstood. If you come on my show and I put out something you said and I put it out wrong, you can compel me to go and correct it. You can compel me to give you the platform again to correct yourself or to fix something you did wrong. But I don't always have the opportunity to do that for myself because mm. it's not about me. And that's what people don't realize. They think that when we have these platforms, we can use them to our advantage. Actually, you can't. If we do that, it's not sustainable and we would lose our position with the public because they expect us to work on their behalf, not on our own behalf.
So getting misunderstood is part of the course. It's part of the job. The so, number... so what do you do when you feel you are misunderstood? You keep quiet, you pray. What do you do? I, I, you I want to get behind. Don't give me a very politically correct answer. What do you do when you feel misunderstood? Do you get angry? Do you talk to friends? Do you, do you, do you cry? Do you run it? I think it depends on who misunderstands me. Tell me. So I can be misunderstood by several people. I could be misunderstood by my audience. I could be misunderstood by my guests, my panelists, my colleagues. <laughs> the, the scope is wide. But depending on who it is, that will determine how I react. So for example, if somebody I don't know, someone I've never met, decides to say something or misrepresent something I've said on social media, you know, and they go out and put up a post, so Koji Yangson says this, that guy, you know, or he's MPP or he's NDC or that guy, you know, he, he, he's corrupt or whatever. And they are saying this because they've misinterpreted or misunderstood something that we've done on the show. The first thing that is clear to me is that this person doesn't know me. So me, the subject of his comments, he doesn't know me. That means he doesn't know his subject. That means he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, if you don't know what you're talking about, how much of my energy should I really exert in you know, trying to combat you or battle you or correct you? So if you don't know me, I'm not likely to exert any energy at all in you know, pursuing a debate to come and chase you to correct myself. But there are times when a stakeholder of a conversation that must continue misunderstands me, like a politician or a businessman or somebody I've had a conversation with, then goes off to misrepresent the interaction that I had with them. That is of concern. Or if my entire audience gets the wrong end of the stick in something I've said, that is also a big concern. And there are examples. Give me one. So one morning, uh, we used to have this format where when I would come in, I would have an interaction with uh, the pastor who hosts the show before mine, Pastor Atuakwa. So one morning I came in, and this was um, in 2015, I think. Yeah. I, I came in, and I, there were some stories going around about the president. And I made a comment which <laughs> sought to contrast. In fact, it's better that I say what I said okay. so that I don't get misunderstood. Wow. So, <laughs> so this is what I said. Um, the pastor said, look, the president is in the news a lot these days. He was riding a motorbike somewhere. And then there was a story that he had, uh, he had licensed a gun. And then, of course, there was the big story about the uh, Ford uh, gift that had, you know, bribe that he had collected. You know, um, it seems people are seeing a lot of negative things about the president. And I said, well, we need to put it in perspective. It's not really about the motorbike. It's not really about the gun. If you're talking about things like the president riding a bike or holding a gun, really the conversation is about security. If you're talking about, you know, the president taking a, you know, receive, accepting a bribe, really the conversation is about governance. So those are the issues, security and governance, not motorbike, gun, and car. I mean, if you were to take those three things, you could be talking about anyone. You could be talking about an armed robber. But that's not what we're talking about. Those were my comments. Someone heard this and posted on social media. Kujo Yangson says the president is an armed robber. Are you joking? And to this day, to this day, there are people who say this on social media, that I said former President Mahama is an armed robber. Isn't it possible to cut... I'm just asking, forgive my, the simplicity of my suggestion. Mm -hmm. In a case like this, considering the sticks, even though you admit that you're a conduit and therefore you should not articulate your own side of the story, isn't mm -hmm. it possible to just cut that part and help somebody to understand? Even if they don't, at least you afford them the opportunity or point them to the stream and say, listen, while you may feel this strongly about it, I did not say that. Is that? Not uh, uh, that would be the ideal solution. Unfortunately, the time this happened, in fact, it led us to solve, to fix this problem at multimedia. At that time, we had a certain format for recording shows. We record from the beginning to the sign-off, and you would time the recording as such, so you would stop it at the sign-off. Oh, don't tell me that one. Of course. So my show was supposed to start at 6 a.m. I was having this interaction with Pastato at 5.55. He had signed off at 5.50. So it was during the 10 minutes that was not being recorded. Wow. So there's no record of it anywhere in the world. You can't go from him. 
and that was it. You know, we can talk about it and laugh right now, but <laughs> it's the learnings of life. Do you still think back at that incident and feel regrets? Yes. I wish I hadn't made that comment. Not because there's something wrong with it, but because I should have understood its potential to be misunderstood. I should have got that. That's my responsibility. I take the blame for that. For students of public speaking out there, especially when it is amplified on huge platforms like radio and television, what is the lesson about extempore communication? This is actually something that was later reinforced when I read one of your books. Uh, I think it's the, the one with the Ten Commandments, how to, how to Speak Like a Pro. Speak Like a Pro, yeah. Yes. You read it? I did. That's a big credit. <laughs> <laughs> I love that book. Wonderful. And one of the lessons I, I picked from it is the answer to this question. Speaking extempore is something that really brings emotion to a conversation. It's a positive. It's a plus. It's something that if you can master is very, very important. But it is not for the slow-witted. Mm. In fact, the best way to speak extempore is to plan it. A thousand percent right, sir. Yeah. That's the best. The best way to come across spontaneous is to plan it. Today on our show, we do that. There are times when we will have a conversation. It seems like it came out of nowhere. Which one is better, Fanti Kinke or Ga Kinke? Or which one is better, uh, uh, Lumba or who is better, Lumba or Kujuenchi? It might seem as if they were born out of uh, you know, spontaneous moments. They were not. They were thoroughly planned the day before. And when we come on air, we are executing a blueprint. Mm. And that's the only and best way to do these things. The more prepared you are, the safer you are. You know, and that's the big lesson for me. There are two mistakes in my career that are following me to this day that I can't seem to undo. One of them is what I just told you about. The other one happened when there was the explosion at Atomic Junction. That's what I remember very well. Yes. Where I turned up and, you know, once again, it's an example of how even your best intentions can lead you into a ditch yeah, if you don't, don't talk pay about attention. It today. Yes. Tell me, what happened? So we turned up that night. I'm one of the few journalists who stayed there throughout the night from the time of the explosion until maybe midday the following day. We were there. I went home briefly, 45 minutes to go and change, and I came back. Now, while we were there, all we were doing was talking to eyewitnesses. That's all we did. So if I tell you that I spoke to maybe 30, 35 eyewitnesses, that is probably an understatement. All of them told me one thing. There were no variations. They said that they saw. First of all, you know how um, when gas is rising in the air, it sort of displaces, so you can, you can see a shimmer when there is gas escaping. You can see a shimmer in the air. That's what they first saw, and it was engulfing the truck that was unloading the gas. So obviously the people who were offloading it had noticed the leak and started to shout for people to leave the area because it could go up any minute. So people started to move away. There was a young man who sells kebab at the junction. And he was one of the people who moved away. He grabbed all his sticks of kebab and started running towards the shops that are near the overhead. I, I, I spoke to a lady who is a sister or cousin of his who runs one of those stands at the shops. And she said that when he was running back, she shouted to him that he had left his fire on. Mm. So he should go back and douse the fire. As he turned round to go back, everyone saw this. It seemed as if the fire formed a, a pillar. Okay, because the, the gas had started to waft all around the area. Right. So it connected. It found the nearest flame, and it was that fire. So it, it, the fire burnt all the gas, because the gas had come from wherever it is, all the way to the fire. So it burnt from there all the way back to the source. It burnt all the gas in its, in its path, okay? So it seemed as if the fire rose up like a pillar and then went this way and then connected with the source and, and then there was the was big explosion. And when the fire spread out like that, like a, like a cloud, there was a gentleman, a journalist, who was trying to photograph it or film it at the top of the overhead. And the fire came up towards him. Everybody 
you know, tried to sort of move back from it. But unfortunately, he lost his footing and he fell. He's the only person who died. He fell and must have broken his neck from the top of there. And he's the only person who died. So I tried to narrate what all these eyewitnesses had told me, which, by the way, I had spoken to a fire officer who had also confirmed that that is what seems to have been the source of the fire. Now, let's be clear. This doesn't mean that the kebab seller is the one who caused the explosion. Absolutely. The people who were trying to offload the gas and were doing it wrong are the ones who caused the explosion. He was just going about his daily business. So I attempted to narrate this, and this is where I made a mistake, about two mistakes. Mistake one, I should have started by saying, this is what eyewitnesses have told me. But I simply started by telling this. I love to tell stories. So I just went into the story without saying, this is what eyewitnesses have told me. First mistake, basic fundamental rule of journalism. Second mistake, they had all pointed to the stand where the kebab seller was. Right next to it was a stand where a, a roasted plantain seller operates. She hadn't even come to work that day. So her stand was covered. There was a stone on top of it. I had mistaken that for the kebab seller stand, which had blown up. You know, so it was lying on its side somewhere. I didn't even see it. I thought the one there with the stone on top of it was his stand. So in all my descriptions, I pointed to it. That was not it. So naturally, on social media, there were two things for people to pick at, two mistakes. And they justly picked at it and pointed out what was wrong with my explanation. To this day, people make jokes about it. Somebody took a picture of me and put me in a fire uniform like a fire, a fire officer, Jay Youngson. To this day, people make jokes about chichinga when they, speak, when, they, when they speak to me. And I take it in good humor. What was that? What was the lowest moment in all this? I think it was when I became, it was clear that people were very pleased that I had stumbled. Why? I don't know. But I suppose it makes sense. You know, if you step on toes long enough, uh, there are people just waiting uh, for yours to be stepped on too. Yeah. Let me give you some room to breathe by shifting away from the heavy duty parts of your life. Talk about something that will make you smile. Your son, what kind of world do you want him to have? <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, I think I have to accept that I can't, I will never, he will never live in the world I want him to live in. But give me, give me describe it for me. What I would like for my son is a world in which he's judged by his efforts, he's judged by his merits. He's loved because he's a human being where he's allowed to make mistakes and learn from them. And when he does well, it is acknowledged. I would love for him to grow up in a world where people don't consider him their enemy because he has different views. I would love for him to grow up in a world where if he works hard, it is rewarded. And if he's given responsibility, he's expected to use it for the greater good. And he will not be laughed at for being honest and not enriching himself. I would love my son to grow up in a world where he can do whatever he sets his mind to. Because he is very, very smart. He's very intelligent. There are a million things he could do and do well. I would love for him to be able to explore all of his dreams. That's the world I would love him to live in. I have come to acknowledge that he won't have that world. So I'm raising him to live in the world he will live in. He will grow up to live in. That world of hardship, that world where you are not given opportunities based on merit, that world where you are expected to fight and claw for everything, that world where the only way you can live a virtuous life and get away with it is if you do it for the benefit of others. So that's the life I'm growing him or raising him to live. And so far, so good. I like the smile that comes to your face when you come by yourself. Not, 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 it's, it's almost a combination of a smile and tears. I don't know if, if it's a contradiction, but... Yeah, I know what you, you mean. You, you, I, you're yeah. very passionate about your son. I love my son so much. He's the best thing I've ever done. And I feel like if I fail at everything and I still manage, along with his mother, 
to make him into a good human being, I will die happy. Say this again, please. If I fail at everything, but along with his mother, I succeed in making him a good human being, I will die happy. That's a very strong statement. Stronger than even what you said about your love for the, the Super Morning Show and your love for the work. I interviewed Catherine Crowley Dusey, who said that take away every achievement of mine, take away every business success of mine. Parenthood is my biggest achievement. Would you align with those thoughts? One hundred percent. Why? One hundred percent. Because it's not a job. It's not a vocation. It's a purpose. It's a purpose. It's one. You know how they always say that um, you know there are two important days um, uh, in your life: the day you were born and the day you discover why. Uh, he's why. You know, whatever he will become in the future, it's up to us as his parents. And so, I take full responsibility for his future glory. Mm. You know, and that is not a job. It's not something that you do and then take a break and go and rest and come back and then you get remuneration for it. It's not. It's a purpose. It's the reason for everything I do. If I'm going to succeed in my career, it's because I want to set a good example for my son. Mm. You know, if I'm going to live in harmony with others, it's because I want my son to live in harmony. If I'm going to make friends, it's because I want my son to benefit. Everything I do is for him. I tell you what, I would have, I would have loved to explore your love for Swansea football club. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to explore your love for photography <laughs> and then your love for fashion. Yeah. But there's one thing I can't let you leave without, okay. and that is your faith. Tell me about your faith. This That's is my position. Faith. Yes, this is, my, this is who I am. Um, you hear people say to you, I'm a Christian, or um, uh, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person, or, I'm a, you know, people have very nice ways of describing who they are when it comes to faith. Mine is, I'm a sinner. That's who I am. I'm a sinner. So my, my entire existence is a, is a battle for grace. Mm. I'm, I'm seeking it. It's there for me, I know. So I'm seeking it. And I'm seeking to be worthy of it. That's it. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he, he, he was sacrificed to redeem me. <laughs> and that is an ongoing relationship. That's an ongoing relationship. That's what they call eternal life. It's not, you know, dying and going to heaven. But it's that relationship with Jesus Christ. The reason why even I, even I, can hold my head up high among humans. You know what? Even in your frailty of description, if I may use those words, which are my own coinage, mm -hmm. you capture the issue of grace in a way that many fail to do. And I'll tell you why. A friend of mine, when you ask him, Otsen Den, you are a funny man, so yes. let me go that way. Yes. If you send out Otsen Den, Otsen Den, you are a It's a yeah. beautiful one. Yeah. Good evening to you, Niamh Asian from here. He says, Niamh Gudur consider Yes. And you say that is the reason, and, and for those who don't understand the heavenly language of funny, it mm. simply means that when you ask him, how are you? He will say, God is continually considering us. And you see, that's the reason why somebody like you can hold your head up among humans. You think that it's all about the grace of God allowing a normal human being yeah. to be able to aspire to do great things. I'll tell you what. What you have done this evening is give us a very, very honest, relatable connection to the Kujo behind the one who gets to hold the microphone. I have enjoyed it, and I've gotten a deeper understanding of who you are. And when you hold the microphone, the next Monday morning, or the next time I hear you hosting the show, I will listen with a different perspective. For those who are big note stickers, Please let's continue this conversation on social media because I can't <laughs> unpack the full length. We've talked about the weight of responsibility, hosting the SMS, wanted to do that since he was 17, talked about Valco, the time in London, rehearsing. We've talked about love. We've talked about parental expectation in the Kings at St. Augustine's. <laughs> talked about objectivity, 
public good, personal interest, that big one about being misunderstood, and the two biggest mistakes of his career, one being that early morning interaction with Pastor Tu that was misrepresented and unfortunately not recorded, and then the second one that was recorded but not well presented enough. Two things that will live with him for the rest of his life, but which have provided priceless training and education for him. He says, speaking extempore brings emotion and spontaneity, but the best is to plan that extempore. And he says, as a people, sometimes we descend to the basest parts of ourselves and really rejoice when somebody is down and somebody seems to have been kicked. And that part of us is not the very best of us. Uh, then he talked about the world your son must live in, but cannot live in, and how you are raising him to live in the world that he will live in. And then on parent to that beautiful point about if you feel at everything but are able to, with, along with his mother, raise him to be a better person and a positive contributor to society, you would have succeeded at everything. But a beautiful note on which you end is about grace. And could you I tell you what? That is a beautiful ending to a great conversation. Let me give you the chance to take us home with your closing thoughts. Wow. Um, have you enjoyed this? I have loved this. I said at the beginning that I've been looking forward to this because springboard and especially the engine room, it's been something that I have, I've used to shape my thoughts. And I've always thought that those who have come through here, they're the best of us. And so the engine room has now become a rite of passage for the high achievers in our society. And it's a brilliant rite of passage. It's a great bus stop. Where you, can, where you can turn around and look at what you've done and others can do it with you. Mm. So that hopefully by the time you get to your destination, there are a few others in your footsteps behind you. Mm. So if, if our show also achieves that, then what a wonderful way to spend an hour. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And I also thank you to you. And if I can do so, pray for you that God will continue to watch over you, that God will continue to guide you. And the dreams and aspirations that you have not just for your son, but for public good, will come to pass as the Lord continues to guide you. So God bless you, my brother. God bless you too, Osofo. This has been a very engaging, very emotional at some parts, very revealing and very, very beneficial edition of the Engine Room with my brother, Koji Yangson, host of the Super Morning Show for the past eight years, unpacking with no handbrake the story of his life. Share this with someone. Share and share and share again. And let's tell a story that is bound to get even better with every single year. On behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort and our partners, MTN Pauls, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, Central University, the Multimedia Group, where Kujo resides by day and by night, and of course, their graphic business, this has been Albert Okran saying, God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you.